I'm Julia Frostino. I am an assistant professor of strategic communication here in the Reed College of Media at WVU. And I want to welcome you to Integrate Online, which is presented by the West Virginia University Reed College of Media, which offers renowned online master's degree programs in marketing communication. Um, today, we'll be discussing data-driven COVID-19 vaccine communication. Again, I'm Julia Frosino, and I'm here with my colleagues, Dr. Dan Totske and Major Holly Nelson. They'll introduce themselves here in just a moment. Um, please be sure to keep your mics muted while we're speaking, and then um, we will open up for questions at the end of this session. Um, but please do feel free to send your questions or comments along in the chat as we move along. Um, so I have some slides that we'll get started with in just a moment to give you some background on COVID-19 vaccine communication that's social science data driven in our mountain state. And then I'll move to a moderated Q&A session with uh, Dr. Totske and Major Nelson. I'll present some questions to them. They will answer. Um, you're welcome again to pop your thoughts into the chat. We'll address those as we go along and again at the end. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll get us sharing slides here in just a moment. Okay. Well, I've said our names a few times, so I won't belabor that point. Um, but I will tell you that um, I'm joining you here from the West Virginia University Public Interest Communication Research Lab. Um, and, and we call it the PIC Lab. And at the PIC Lab, I am the founding director. Um, and Dr. Totske is one of our faculty research affiliates. Um, in the PIC Lab, we unite social scientists who have a, pas a passion for driving positive social change. Um, basically, public interest communication is a, an emerging field that merges theory and practice that looking at campaign development, implementation, and evaluation um, for science-based strategic communication that really moves the needle on people's attitudes and behaviors on items that are of public interest. So beyond the goals of any single organization, but really uniting social scientists for positive social change. And within our lab, we focus on social science research that um, generally is falls into four camps. And those are community advocacy and engagement, crisis and risk communication, media sociology, and science communication. Of course, COVID-19 and the pandemic um, surely falls into those categories, several of them. Um, and so my lab has been working very closely with the state, um, Dr. Totske, and then also Dr. Gia Presgrove here in the Reed College of Media. And I have been leading um, the lab efforts to drive social science-based communication to help develop messaging that is tailored to West Virginians um, and specific audiences within West Virginia to ensure that they are informed on COVID-19 vaccines um, and can make a confident and informed choice to get vaccinated if, if that's what they decide to do for themselves and their families. Um, so for those of you who are less familiar with West Virginia, um, basically just to give you some context, we have a population of about 1.8 million people, which uh, is about the size of, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, a medium-sized city, but sprawled out across this vast rural landscape with 55 counties. Um, and we often rank among the lowest in U.S. health outcomes uh, and risks, um, diabetes, obesity, heart conditions, and a variety of chronic diseases and illness, which led the Kaiser Family Foundation very early on in this pandemic to um, name West Virginia as a state with among the highest share of adults at risk of serious COVID-19 illness and for CDC to come visit us because we were in the red um, in terms of um, concerns about our ability and uh, to administer vaccines quickly and efficiently. Um, but as many of you might have seen as this pandemic has rolled along, West Virginia wound up rising to the top of the nation in vaccine administration. And um, while that has been strictly <laughs> a result of incredible partnerships such as through the National Guard, which uh, made, uh, Major Nelson will tell you about in just a moment. Um, and it did too 
become at the top of the nation because of coordinated communication in part, at least. And so part of that is through the Joint Information Center, which um, Major Nelson leads, which is in the Joint Interagency Task Force for COVID-19 Vaccines, which is basically uh, a unites so many of the state's key players in um, understanding cons constituencies, communicating with them and making decisions for the state, everything from the governor's office to DHHR, the National Guard, FEMA has come in and helped, of, of course, our PIC lab and a variety of other um, players, especially the Center for Rural Health Development, which has been really important and integral in this um, communication um, coordination and uh, digital relativity, which is a West Virginia based um, marketing agency. Um, and through the Joint Information Center, um, the pandemic leadership and all of the main players in the state have realized from the beginning the need to establish partnerships for coordinated communication that no single entity could handle this completely on their own. Even DHHR and their amazing resources and, and, and staff and folks who are committed to this cause, this, is, this global pandemic is just one of the um, ways that West Virginians will come together in partnerships and in teamwork to serve other West Virginians. Um, but from a communication standpoint, we of course re recognize the need to understand our audiences and develop, to develop evidence-based messages. Through, so through the PIC Lab, um, we've been conducting analysis and evaluation work funded through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, and administered through um, West Virginia DHHR in partnership with the Center for Rural Health Development led by Elaine Darling. Um, so our approach in West Virginia um, to drive data-driven communication has been uh, mixed method social science, both quantitative and qualitative. And we've done everything from statewide surveys to par particular population surveys, to testing specific messages experimentally, to focus groups and interviews and visiting on sites and doing intercept interviews, direct observation, and basically the vast tools available through social science. We have been using the overwhelming majority of them in participating participatory action ways and informative ways and uh, to really understand the hearts and the minds and the behaviors of West Virginians and key groups of West Virginians to give them the information that they want, need, and deserved um, to make a confident decision. And we've been remained adaptive and continue to apply our expertise. So I, I'm a crisis and risk communication scientist. Um, Dr. Totsuke is a health and risk communication scientist. And we combine our social science research methods with our background and expertise in behavior change theory and those um, literatures that can inform what we're doing. Um, and again, partnerships have been incredibly key. So we meet regularly with statewide communication work group. Um, and this work group is includes uh, representatives from the Advisor Commission on African American Disparities, the West Virginia Healthcare Association, uh, local health associations, primary care extension, and, uh, and a variety of, of others who help us understand the wants and needs of their populations and who can, who, and through which we can distribute um, the resources that we create for them. And again, all of our work goes, um, especially frequently asked questions or the kinds of like medical um, background information we provide goes through a medical advisory board of specialists and medical ethicists, um, and then is translated into tactics through digital relativity, um, which is the firm I mentioned to you earlier. Um, and this enables us to create tailored and uh, messages that are tailored to West Virginia and targeted to our specific population um, through stra strategy and tactics that are going to resonate with audience self-interest, that are going to be delivered through the channels that they prefer and where they're already living and where they're already seeking health information that are going to be presented by the messengers who they find credible and trustworthy and that ultimately seek to advance health equity um, and we're always um, paying close attention to culturally responsive language and verbal and visual inclusivity in all that we do. Um, and to give you just kind of an example of where we started and how we've translated that before I start um, opening this up to the questions for our phenomenal panelists. Um, if we go all the way back to the beginning of this pandemic, before a single shot was in an arm of a single West Virginian, um, our PIC lab launched a statewide benchmark survey. And at that time, we wanted to know what are West Virginians thinking and feeling about health in general, about risks, about the pandemic, about COVID-19 vaccines in particular, and what would be at that time their intention to get vaccinated. 
what are the, the um, barriers that they're seeing to getting vaccinated and what are the things that are motivating them to get vaccinated. So at that time, we, um, we oh, sorry. So at that time in, in um, late November and early December, we found that um, as far as intentions to get vaccinated were concerned, about 20% of West Virginians were strongly unwilling to get vaccinated to so the very bottom of that. Like if you think of a, one, a scale of one to seven, where one, they're completely unwilling, and seven, they're extremely willing to get vaccinated. About 20% of West Virginians resided at that strong, I'm not going to do this. But um, we did find that 25% were kind of less willing. So right before maybe the midpoint on that scale, but not all the way at one across the board. 12% of West Virginians were right in the middle, like a four on that one to seven scale, neutral, unsure. Uh, and then 43% were either strongly planning or somewhat willing to get vaccinated. About 9% of those were like the seven across the board. Um, so we did have a, a pretty wide, you know, persuadable publics, movable middle, fence sitters, you know, however you want, wait and see, however you want to um, describe them. But, but understanding what they were thinking and feeling, what, was, what were their barriers and what were their motivations would enable us to create messages that would address their concerns and um, help prompt their motivations so that they could make an informed decision. And that led us to messaging that um, focus on enhancing confidence in the development process. We were hearing early on that main concerns were, I'm not sure about the safety. I'm not sure about the effectiveness. I'm not sure about what it means that this came so quickly to market. So answering those kinds of concerns um, with fact-based, data-driven, scientifically sound information was paramount. And uh, that led us to our message platform, Safe, Effective, Trusted. Um, showcasing the motivating benefits of vaccination. Um, we see in West Virginia and we continue to see this kind of distribution, we call it like a bimodal distribution where we have like on one end, there's like protect myself. I wanna protect myself and maybe my family and that's what's going to make me decide to choose to get vaccinated. And then we have an entire other group of people who are like, I'm doing this because of a more kind of altruistic reason. I wanna protect my community. I wanna protect others. I would never wanna be the person who gets COVID-19, doesn't realize it and, and passes it along to someone vulnerable. Um, so these messages led us to our, um, our main kind of slogan, community immunity begins with me. It, it emphasizes that dual role of me, myself, and community, um, and then the protection kind of messaging that resonates with people across the board, protecting, whether it's yourself, your community, your family, your coworkers, living regular life is another message that has started to come up for us. Um, and then removing those barriers and perceived barriers, oftentimes those were related to cost or access to the vaccine. Um, and that continues to evolve over time. And then we also realize that messaging that underscores hope and optimism and other kind of positive emotions um, was also a predictive of people's intentions to vaccinate. So um, framing our messages in terms of the hopefulness that vaccination provides us, especially from related um, from local trusted experts and local, local, local is where it comes down to with it, with as even as the vaccination program um, develops, people trust their local healthcare workers, their local community members and um, medical experts in the field who are close to them, either geographically or look and act and feel like them and are in West Virginia. Um, and to give you an example of just some of the ways that we turn this social science messaging into implementation and tactical delivery, um, we have vaccinate.wv.gov, um, which is a, a web site and page um, maintained by the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources. Um, and on, on that website, we have a, a section on frequently asked questions that we uh, update based on CDC and ASIP guidance and others and the experts in our, in our um, state and our coronavirus czar uh, march and the pandemic leadership, but also driven by how the social science data tells us what do people want to know and what, what are they worried about and what do they want to hear about. Um, we have the um, West Virginia COVID-19 vaccine info line people can call. We know that not everybody in West Virginia is online and we know that some people are more comfortable talking to a, a human being about these things. So um, the info line is there. We have our key messages platform. We, we distribute these 
through um, more than 300 community partners and the communication work group I told you about, we have this regularly updated communication toolkit for our healthcare workers and community partners. Um, that's now on version six. We had that earlier on, even before CDC had a, a toolkit, we were working on that here in our state. Um, we do frequently ask questions that are tailored and targeted to specific communities. So when we find that maybe um, vaccine uptake is low or people are having concerns in a particular population, we'll go in and find out what are, what are your concerns and use those data to tailor communication specifically for them. Um, we also have the social press kit. Um, you're welcome to visit that and I'll pop that into the chat a little bit later if you're interested. But the social press kit um, houses some of our assets that our community partners can use um, to share information about COVID-19 vaccination, both um, graphics for social media and various social media channels, as well as um, printables, flyers, um, and other means of distribution for uh, questions or registration information um, or things like that. And then person-to-person -person talking, pandemic leadership town halls, um, relationship building with faith-based leaders, um, and then the local piece like ambassador vaccine journeys. Um, Digital Relativity has worked with several people who just have chronicled their own journeys, getting vaccinated and why they did it and their experiences doing it um, that they could then share with their community members. And we continue to do ongoing needs assessment for marginalized communities. We, for instance, focus have focused very um, specifically on those who have been found to be at higher risk or more disproportionately affected by COVID-19, um, such as Black and African-American West Virginians and um, Spanish-speaking populations in our state. Um, so just to give you just a few examples before I wrap up this kind of overview of where we've been in West Virginia and COVID-19 messaging. Um, so we told you the key platform, safe, effective, trusted, that comes straight from the data and what people wanted to hear and what mattered to them. Um, safety is a, is a big one, and vaccination is the safest path to community immunity. Uh, the, the slogan I told you about, kind of where we base all of our messages, community immunity begins with me. Um, addressing examples of how we address some of the questions that people have about vaccination. We'll have like vaccination facts, vaccine facts, um, or others. Um, how have the COVID-19 vaccines been developed so quickly? And then the body of the post will explain. Um, this is an example of how uh, specific message testing um, plays out. So in West Virginia, we know that, um, that, that people are not responding as well to the idea of mass vaccination. Um, and we know this from a few methods, both quantitative and qualitatively, but even just if you did a thought experiment right now with yourself, if you think, um, if you do it this way, think mass blank, and fill in that blank. What's the, what are the first three words that come to mind if I say mass blank? What comes to mind for you? In our research, we'll find that people will say hysteria or genocide or shootings um, or a variety of other kind of really horrible, horrible uh, cognitive associations with the word mass. We call all of our clinics in West Virginia community vaccination clinics. It's a place where the community comes together to protect themselves and, the, uh, and those around them. Um, we translate a variety of our, um, our materials into Spanish. We know that the Spanish speaking population wants Spanish materials um, and we do that. And one of their main concerns has been cost. So the vaccines are free, the COVID-19 vaccines are free. We translate CDC materials into West Virginia tailored materials. This is an example of how the CDC um, provided a sticker template and then um, our team worked to create a sticker. The I got my COVID-19 vaccine WV strong sticker um, for our state um, and then our vaccine priorities from our pandemic leadership. Um, so that's kind of just the background and, and a kind of overview of where we are in terms of data driving communication in the mountain state for COVID-19 vaccines. And I have uh, Dr. Dan Totske here with me today, who is one of my phenomenal lab mates who has been working to um, create some of that uh, um, important messaging. And I have Dr. Uh, General Holly, sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> Major, I always want to call her general because in my mind, she should be a general. She's just phenomenal, y'all. Um, but Major Holly Nelson is here and she runs the JIC that I kind of briefly told you about before. So uh, I would like for them to introduce themselves. And I, um, if we could start with um, both of you and we'll start with Holly, but both of you, if you could introduce yourselves, your background in communication and your role in the pandemic, that would be uh, great for our audience to hear about, please. Thanks, Julia. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Major Holly Nelson. Um, I am the Director of Strategic Communications for the West Virginia National Guard. And for the past decade, I have been a public affairs officer in the United States Air Force. So much of my communications background comes from serving in that role in the military. Um, I studied um, journalism and mass communication with a concentration in public relations from Kent State University and graduated from there in 2014. Um, actually received my master's degree while I was deployed overseas to Kuwait. Um, and so I have served at that strategic level, um, being a chief of public affairs in a deployed environment um, at the height of um, ISIS taking over in Iraq. And so I've seen kind of um, where the military public relations can play out in a deployed environment. And then I have kind of worked my way up through um, the ranks on the military side and serving now at that strategic role um, as an advisor to the adjutant general for communication strategies for the entire force of 6,500 um, soldiers, airmen and civilians in the West Virginia National Guard. And as Dr. Frostino said, I have been leading the Joint Information Center, um, which is really a, a fancy term for um, what we use for um, a national information management, a NIM strategy, FEMA strategy for emergency response, it would be a joint information center. And so there's a lot of military terminology kind of thrown around with a joint interagency task force. Um, but really, it's just a lot of people coming together working toward a common goal. And as a part of that, they need um, all of the experts from all of the various agencies who are involved in the response. Um, those communication folks come together and serve um, under the joint information center umbrella. So that's a little bit of my background. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Dan Totske. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Studies at West Virginia University over in the Everly College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and so my background is um, not nearly as impressive as Major Nelson's, but um, I uh, received my uh, PhD from uh, Michigan State University in communication, as well as a master's degree in health and risk communication. So uh, much like Dr. Prestino had mentioned earlier, my background is in uh, health and risk communication. And so my education and my research and teaching since then focuses on um, primarily health communication and especially around uh, the planning of strategic uh, health and risk communication um, and information interventions and things like that. So there was a, a clear uh, connection to uh, the, the pandemic and the pandemic response. And I've been really excited to be a part of um, West Virginia's response. And so my, uh, my, my main research and teaching then, like I said, focuses on sort of understanding uh, decision-making processes that people go through when trying to make decisions about their health or response to risk uh, scenarios. Uh, and trying to uh, best make recommendations to best package information in response to these crises, whether it's the COVID-19 pandemic. I've also worked in uh, the Flint water crisis in Flint, Michigan, and the response uh, as uh, registries uh, for resources were developed, uh, as well as a number of projects in cancer communication, uh, best packaging cancer information resources and the like. So very excited to be here and among uh, some wonderful colleagues. Thank you both. Okay, so with some background um, behind us and um, and understanding kind of the context that our panelists come to this communication environment with, um, I'd like to put our first um, content question to Major Nelson. Major Nelson, you've been a part of this pandemic response since the beginning, and you continue to hold an incredibly essential leadership role in our state's coordinated statewide communication efforts. So could you tell us what that's been like and how communication has evolved over the past year? Sure. Um, so yeah, I've been on a COVID response now for over a year. Um, I actually remember the date um, when we, we were learning about um, potentially preparing for actually the first COVID case. I remember the press conference standing there with my colleagues from um, at that point in time, it was DMAPS, so Military Affairs and Public Safety and DHHR, and we were 
um, the governor was kind of announcing a couple of things and we were like, oh, wow, you know, this is really serious. And we sat down and talked with the public health commissioner right after that in a conference room at the Capitol. And, and she was being um, very calming to us. She had a great kind of um, demeanor and, and helping us understand here's what we need to be prepared for. And so I, I remember that day vividly. And since then, it has been like a fire hose. Uh, learning about the importance of understanding public health and um, risk communication, because with my background in military public affairs, it's definitely something that we really didn't have to um, worry about. It was all about, you know, here's the good things that the military is doing. And as a part of the response and under, um, at the time, General Hoyer's leadership, we were intricately involved in trying to help out our partners. We realized very quickly that this was going to overwhelm the capabilities of um, uh, DHHR. They have a small staff. And so it was really um, all hands on deck. And since that time, we have truly uh, grown our communications uh, efforts in the state of West Virginia. And it's the most coordinated communications response that I have seen in my time in the state. And that's been through multiple um, disaster responses. And I think we've really uh, proven that this framework is um, the best way to move forward as whether it's for um, a flood response or a, a public health emergency as we've been facing for the past year. That's one of the best um, communication tools we can have is to be collaborative, work through those partnerships, um, rely on our experts, and especially um, understand the research that goes into a lot of these communications best practices because um, we wouldn't be where we are today without all of the people on the team um, bringing forth their expertise. Thank you, Major Nelson. Um, let's turn it over to Dr. Totske as well. So you have uh, been contributing incredibly important social science insights that are directly driving messages in the mountain state. What does it mean to have social science research driving messaging? And why is that important to effective health and risk communication, both in this pandemic, but more broadly as well? Yeah. Uh, well, well, first of all, you know, as a, as a social scientist, as a researcher in this realm, it's, it's so incredibly exciting to have uh, an opportunity to directly translate a lot of the things that we talk about or teach our students and things like that and actually see it um, translate directly into um, a public health response, which is a, a rare opportunity uh, for sure. So it's been um, really humbling and really exciting at the same time uh, to, to do that. But so what, what it looks like to be using social science uh, in this uh, kind of uh, informing messaging is really taking a lot of the things that probably a lot of people have uh, learned about in some way or another in classes they took in their training or will read about or if their researchers will talk about a lot. It's always kind of in the abstract, right? And so it's it's taking that sort of that heady kind of wonky theory uh, or sometimes wonky theory and distilling that into uh, actionable recommendations that communicators, all of you, uh, and that we've been working with the, with the state can actually use in their practice. And then uh, not only doing that, but then using those theories and recommendations to guide studies or data collections that we would you know, normally just do as an interest pops up um, throughout a semester, if I budget the time for it or whatever it might be, but instead having that as a priority that drives the types of things that we're trying to study and, and collect data on um, and taking the approach that uh, our public uh, has distinct unique, diverse information needs, uh, and that we want to be understanding those needs and providing recommendations um, that can directly fill in those gaps that people have or the needs or the address the uncertainties that people have, uh, and with the goal of informing decision-making and encouraging a specific route to action, but knowing that uh, we may or may not succeed in that and that we don't want to be forcing people and being sensitive to people's needs and wants uh, and unique situations. And so collecting that data through different sources, uh, like Dr. Frustino you know, had mentioned early on, whether that's surveys, interviews, focus groups, and so on, and then saying, hey, this is what we've found. These are the kinds of topics that people are needing more information on, and we should be spending our limited time and resources on those topics and not so much on these other ones that might sound important, but aren't really, um, we, can, uh, we can establish quantitatively and qualitatively that they're not probably worth our time to address uh, because we have limited time, resources, and capacity. 
Thanks. That was uh, that was a great overview of the importance of social science research, which you know I am biased toward. So I <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to turn for a second and ask you both a question here, and it's going to kind of be like um, the pros and the cons in a way. So. I would love to know what it what has been in this response so far your proudest communication moment and then we'll follow up with is has there been a communication moment that you wish you could redo. So um, let's start with Major Nelson, what has been your proudest moment in the pandemic so far. Um, well, luckily with the audience that we have here, they might understand, but um, getting to present when we um, presented our uh, information to the CDC as a best practice, um, that was one of the proudest moments. Um, and I, I've said this multiple times, but the work that I've done on the pandemic response has been um, the most uh, important work that I have ever done in my career. And that's after deploying overseas and, and working that mission there. But I know this is directly uh, saving people's lives and it has um, put West Virginia on the map. And so getting to be a part of that and to meet so many great people in the process and really build, um, build up West Virginia and to help inform decision-making and allowing people to choose to be vaccinated has been uh, some of the most amazing work that I've ever done. And it's been great. And on the flip side, um, if there's something that I wish that we could have redone, it would have been to um, establish the Joint Information Center much sooner. It really wasn't until um, we were preparing to get vaccines in the state in November um, and planning for that, that we actually formulated a JIC. And it took a little bit of pushing. And I think we have now learned our lesson that this is such an important group to have readily available, whether it's for um, a public health emergency or natural disaster response. We had had numerous discussions previously as a communications work group across the state among the, um, the state agencies of the importance of it. But I think now that we've actually had it functioning and up and running for a couple of months now that we really realize this is going to be instrumental uh, moving forward. So I wish we could have had that at the beginning of, of our response as opposed to trying to, to piecemeal it. And, and it was very difficult as we were all trying to work remotely and, and figure out what's the best way to go forward in our communications. And, and really, uh, thanks, to, thanks to you all and uh, Dr. Costello as well, Dr. Lisa Costello, she's a um, a colleague of ours who is a pediatrician and works at WVU, she was kind of instrumental in just showing up and sitting down and we just kind of made it happen and we have really um, gained a lot of success from that since then. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Toske, your same question. So what uh, has been your proudest communication moment and if you could redo something, what would it be? Yeah, uh, I think the, the, the proudest moment was um, well, there's there's probably like two, one one specific and one kind of more general. Um, for anyone who who's from West Virginia who who's here, having uh, Governor Jim Justice uh, read some of the the points that we supplied for him in talking about uh, the pandemic response and the the um, the vaccine rollout in general, and having seeing uh, you know our recommendations come through in that forum was. Uh, so exciting. Um, just to just again, knowing that like a lot of the times when folks like us would be trying to provide recommendations on these sorts of things, maybe they end up in some report, if even right, and then it's kind of people will, will do will go on with it. But having directly some of the uh, types of terms that we recommended using and just the general approach being used in that form and continuing to be used by the governor, by folks like um, Dr. Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar, and so on. It's just been so exciting to see it, knowing that, hey, I had some small part in that. But really, I think what maybe even more so than that is uh, hearing from our partners throughout the state, and especially in the public health response and the medical response, uh, being seeing that uh, the, the information that we help create or advise on getting so warmly uh, received and just having this sort of sense of relief of oh my god we've needed something like this for so long or you know seeing that this material aid given to people who have been working uh, you know nonstop since day one of this and even before then right uh, has just been really fulfilling knowing that we've had some role to play in making their jobs easier or at least not as difficult and hopefully also encouraging uh, you know vaccination and um, other precautions um, so that's just been really in terms of something uh, to redo, um, 
or, or do differently. Uh, it, it, it's hard to say because it's always, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I think at least for myself is being more assertive in, put, in providing some of the recommendations earlier on or being sort of trying to be more available because uh, just like Major Nelson was saying, like I, I wasn't involved in, in any of this until I was sort of planning for the vaccine rollout itself, um, doing some research in other areas throughout the summer. Uh, and near the be more closer to the beginning of the pandemic, but not really having as uh, as strong or assertive of an eye towards providing these kinds of recommendations and trying to fill in gaps uh, with the the regional response uh, to providing information. Because we see now that while we're still providing information on vaccinations, people still need information on things like masks, on testing, on quarantining, on how to communicate about these things. So that need is stronger than ever. Uh, and so being able to, wishing to have been able to fill that gap sooner with guidance and uh, ideally data would, would have been um, better, uh, but at least we are able to do it now, which is uh, exciting. Yeah, agreed. I Everything you're saying really resonates, both of you, for me. I mean, becoming a CDC best practice and highlighted in that way, especially in our state and seeing the hope and optimism across our state, like in the pride in such a challenging time for me too. I agree with you. And then of course, I mean, Dr. Totsky, I'm always going to agree that using research earlier, sooner, in a more coordinated, cohesive way is always best for strategic communication. I'm not <laughs> not going to disagree with that one. Um, and like like Major Nelson said, I, I I too think this is the most important mission of my life. I haven't served in the incredible capacities that she has for our state, however, and our nation. Um, however, I agree. I mean, it's a it's a true honor to be able to work on this. Um, so moving to a more uh, like a broader question here for um, both of you. So um, what more generally has communicating during this pandemic and about this pandemic taught you about risk, crisis, or health communication? And we could start maybe Major Nelson, <laughs> go back and forth, I guess. All right. Um, like I kind of stated at the beginning, my focus really has been on uh, military public relations and telling good news stories. And sometimes, you know, we would have some negative press, but really it was uh, about telling the stories of our soldiers and airmen. So when it came to um, health communication, it was really outside of my expertise. I mean, um, I have a lot of practice in developing plans and procedures and talking points and um, strategies for communication and um, marketing, but really I was outside of my element. And um, so relying on the expertise of our partners through um, Elaine at the Center for Rural Health Development, who she really focuses on um, the West Virginia Immunization Network. So that's where her work um, focuses on. So understanding that and then um, with the work of um, Julia and Dan and Dr. Costello really um, helped me to understand the importance of the language choice. It was just something that the military really didn't have to focus on was um, all of this research of which words should we use? You know, we, we as a military organization um, use language that is very kind of harsh at times. And we have to be cognizant of that now. And I have, be, I have learned so much in the last year about the, the choices understanding West Virginia's perceptions um, just about the language that we choose. And um, then again, it was also um, a lesson to teach my boss um, as a strategic communicator is how do I take this information and how do I allow somebody who is um, assisting and advising the governor in decision making and help him understand these perceptions, help craft language that is um, helpful to people that is not going to sway them or um, dissuade them from um, choosing to get vaccinated. And it's really been um, an educational process for both myself. And then how do I um, prepare my senior leader, whoever that might be going forward in um, these very important topics, um, communicating outside of the military realm really about um, public health. Thanks. Dr. Totsky, same question. Lessons learned um, during this pandemic 
what have you learned or what has it taught you about risk crisis or health communication, even though you have a PhD in it? No, it's a constant learning process. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, it's reaffirmed and really bolstered a lot of points that we would we would say normally, right? And, and that, you know, theoretically, but also in general practice around health risk and crisis communication, um, but things that could easily be taken for granted, like the importance of partnerships and having the right stakeholders and being consistent and providing clear information, things like that, that it's like, yeah, sure, right? That sounds, that makes sense, especially for people who are professional communicators. But I think it's really strongly reaffirmed for me that to not necessarily take that for granted when talking about uh, recommendations in these kind of scenarios, but also to see the importance of having personal connections, not only among stakeholders for information campaigns or information initiatives, having those strong, consistent, um, high information sharing kind of relationships from the top um, to ensure that information is flowing consistently and that up, especially in an emergent situation where information is literally changing by the hour, it seems sometimes. Um, from the time you wake up, it could be completely different by the time you eat lunch, right? Um, so having, having that sort of uh, structure from the start uh, be so, so, so critical. Again, even though theoretically, that's always sort of like, the, yeah, you should do that. Seeing how much of a difference that truly can make and how much of a difference, you know, not having that, how, what, what the, the, um, the response differences between those. Um, but then also having those same strong connections and relationship building with other communicators, people outside of sort of the structure and being able to bring in um, all of the different voices that a region, a state, a nation might have, right, depending on the scale of the response, um, to ensure that we have equitable distribution of information, that we have appropriately tailored and targeted information for these sorts of things, um, because we see firsthand when it falls short, uh, when people are, even though we're pumping out all this information, still being like, I didn't see it anywhere, right? So it, you know, constantly reaffirming the need to have all of those voices present and listening to those voices from the start and maintaining those relationships um, because it's very obvious when those relationships can fall apart. Uh, people and, and people don't feel like maybe their worth is being reflected. I think we've done a good job of, of doing that, but it's it's you know reaffirming the importance of those kinds of personal connections throughout these kinds of initiatives. Thanks. Um, you know, I was thinking, I, I wonder, Major Nelson, what you think about the, the road ahead. So we've looked back and, and thought about what would we have done differently or what are the lessons learned, but what's the road ahead for you? Um, and what do you see the, as the most pressing communication needs we have moving forward? Well, uh, I think we learned very uh, quickly this morning with the uh, FDA's and CDC's recommendation to halt Johnson & Johnson vaccinations that we still have a long way to go. Um, just for the edification of um, the group here with us today, we have been uh, having discussions about how do we help um, people make informed choices for those who are at a lower rate of um, vaccine uptake in the state of West Virginia. We're seeing it in a younger population right now. And then obviously educating parents of teenagers. So that's kind of been the emphasis that we're looking at um, pushing research toward and uh, developing information for. So those um, groups of people can make that informed choice. And then um, we had to shift focus today. And that's kind of what we've been working on all morning long is how is this affecting West Virginians? How is this going to affect our message? And um, we know that we're gonna be in this for the long term. It's, it's not just something that's gonna go away tomorrow, even um, as we've seen vaccinations continue to be on the rise and people changing their minds, but this is gonna be a long-term um, educational campaign that we'll be involved with for many years to come, just like with any emergency response that we would deal with from a, a military perspective. You know, you have your initial response, which happens within the first couple of days or weeks of the event taking place, but then you have all of the recovery on the back end. And so we're still in the actual initial response of this because we still have new cases. We still have new variants coming in. We're still learning a ton about the vaccinations themselves. Um, there may be more um, vaccines that become available or get um, emergency authorization. Um, so we still have a ton of communication to do. And um, so our job 
won't end for a long time. And that it makes me excited because I still get to work with um, some of the best people I've met in my career. And also that um, we look forward to being on the other end of this and getting back to a sense of normalcy. But um, we know that it's it's a long haul. It's, it, we're potentially looking at still years down the road before we're not having discussions about COVID-19 and vaccines and uh, the response that we've had as a state. Thanks, Major Nelson. I agree with all of that. And, and um, yeah, I guess that if there is some silver lining here in all of this, it's that we've all got to come together and do this important work together and build these partnerships, both I think us as a research team and Dr. Costello and Elaine Darling and the folks over at Digital Relativity and all of that, but but also um, you know strengthening, I put it in the chat, but the idea that we're, we're creating here too an infrastructure for health resilience in the state, these partnerships, I, it is my hope and wish that they won't just, you know, go away as this as this pandemic wanes down and as I hope we, we gain a hold on it in, in the vaccination piece, but that we are able to continue to be stronger and learn and grow and be stronger in all of the challenges we'll face moving forward because of the work that we're putting in now. Um, before I open it up to q and A, I, I mean, I want to remind you all and, and encourage you all to put any questions that you have in the chat and we'll address those um, live here or feel free to follow up with any of us as well afterward. Um, but for um, Major Nelson, Dr. Totsuke, either of you, do you have any final thoughts or hints or tips for our audience before we open up this Q&A piece? Dan, I'll let you go first. Sure. Um, I would say, you know, it, it's really um, keeping central the needs of the audience, which I think as, as communicators and people plan that kind of thing, it's it, that can be sort of like a, yeah, of course, right? But remembering that, I, I think, especially in times of crisis like this, um, it, the, the gut reaction that we see even happening, right? It's just, okay, presenting factual information, right? Or, you know, the high, this high level stuff that is technically correct, um, but uh, not necessarily thought out because sometimes you just don't have time for it. But I think still making sure to take uh, time to thoughtfully consider who the actual audiences of this information is and making sure that it's going to resonate with them in the way that's intended. Again, I think as, as communicators uh, and, and media professionals that should be like, yes, of course, right? But I think it, it's constantly reminding ourselves of that because w when, when we get into these like high stress, uh, uncertain and ever-changing situations that can easily get lost. So I think constantly remembering um, to keep that at the forefront. Um, I also think uh, a big thing, uh, and it's sort of a lesson learned, but also a tip going forward too, is to um, not take for granted uh, the, the benefit of informing or, or mentoring or assisting in other communicators and other policymakers and stakeholders in this process of a lot of these best practices that maybe professional communicators might uh, know well and practice and teach others about, but making sure that we're sharing with uh, you know the other stakeholders who may be involved, understanding that everybody is going to be a source of this information, regardless of how wide reaching their audience is. So I think um, keeping in mind the power of helping others more clearly uh, and effectively communicating about these topics uh, can be, uh, regardless of where someone's at in their career uh, or what or what their you know what their role might be is, is constantly remember thinking about how can we make this communication more effective in this scenario and moving forward. So I think not taking for granted the the importance of centering the audience, but also um, using uh, our abilities and our knowledge to sort of spread the love in terms of uh, you know effective communication. I would agree with that, Dan. I think the the collaboration is one has been one of the most vital keys to our success. Um, I know we've been on many calls at night, um, literally changing words in a sentence because we're concerned about how that might be perceived in the public, and it paid dividends, honestly, in the trust um, that the general public had in what we were saying, and um, it, it has really been a, a, a true lesson learned. 
And um, one of the things that I really picked up on that, you know, it's easy to dismiss at times, but uh, I have to give Dr. Costello a lot of credit for this. And she, she says it in a lot of our meetings is that perception is reality to people. And as a communicator, we have to understand that people, especially in a public health um, crisis like we've been facing, um, understanding how to communicate to those when you're dealing with um, tons of information coming out all at once. So information overload, misinformation, um, but also those fears and perceptions that people have and um, especially in different communities that you're, um, you're working with or you're tailoring your communications to. So whether that be somebody in an African-American community, understanding the history and the background of how vaccinations have negatively affected that population throughout um, the entirety of their existence to um, tailoring the language so that it's equitable information um, access. Um, we spend a lot of time um, literally going through a website, ensuring that we have language available or resources available for somebody who's deaf or hard of hearing or visually impaired. And, and how do we say that the right way? How are we um, open and um, considering all of our audiences. So you really can't just say, well, this has worked previously. So I'm just going to cut and paste that from a communication standpoint. You really have to open your eyes and see what gaps are out there. And that happens when you're collaborating with others and talking to people um, across the spectrum. And um, that, has, that has been the most beneficial thing for us and, and helped us in our success along the way. Thank you both. Um, so we have a couple of, <clears throat> excuse me, comments in the chat. Um, not huge questions yet, but um, some points about sharing. So I don't know. Um, so uh, Jason Swenson asked us uh, if the gov uh, governor is sharing with his peers or what kind of, uh, well, she didn't quite ask it, but I'll ask it. What kind of sharing is going on? Like, how are we, how are we conveying the work that we're doing? to others across the nation to not just strengthen our infrastructure here in our state, but to strengthen the infrastructure of our nation's ability to, to respond to, um, to public health crises or other disasters that we might encounter. So I don't know if either of you wanna want to respond to that. I'm sure I can start off and Dan, if you have anything to add, feel sure. free. Um, at the beginning, really, um, when we were, kind of leading the nation. West Virginia was um, on the front of every newspaper and at the, the headline of every nightly news um, station. And we were really getting a lot of great public feedback. And so those best practices um, for the vaccination effort overall, logistically speaking, operationally speaking, we were sharing those with other states. And I know multiple times we were reached out to um, from other states or from the White House at the time to, to share what we were doing um, from that operational standpoint, but then also from our communication standpoint, um, we've presented to the CDC as a best practice. We've been on multiple calls um, through the STAT network, which I don't even know what that one means. I, I think it's just a conglomerate of other state communication partners and um, we've presented to them as well on our communication methods and what the PIC Research Lab has been doing and also sharing just um, with our agency partners here who might not be as intricately involved in um, the communication planning that we've had going on. So um, up and down the chain, really, we've been, we've been talking with our partners about um, the research that's gone into it and why West Virginia has been so successful. Yeah, I was going to just add to that. I think um, we've, I think everybody on the team and especially a lot of uh, the pandemic leadership in the state as well uh, has, has done a good job of basically taking any opportunity possible to, to share um, you know, similar insights to what Dr. Prostino shared in the slides earlier today. Um, and much like has been talked about with sharing with the CDC and other officials, but even just our other state partners, I think just um, getting the model of what we've been following out because it's constantly seen as, oh, wow, this is, you know, the, even though we might think like, yeah, this is the right thing to do. It's, it's not necessarily, we're, I think we're noticing more and more, not necessarily the model or approach that a lot of other um, states and, and groups have taken. And so I think just each of us sort of taking any opportunity we can to get word out and share what we've done and offer recommendations to groups of all levels and scope um, 
has been um, has been helpful. And I think it's just all of us sort of seeing that as a necessary component of what we're doing, as necessary as sharing this information with our public, sharing it with others as well. Um, that's a perfect transition to another question that we have in the chat. But before we get there, I want to say too that um, we are committed to uh, um, to growing the body of science around all of this as well. So. I'll be honest that we're moving at pandemic pace and, and, and at least my lab's focus at the moment is really contributing to the state and saving lives in the moment. That's, that's the number one for us um, ethically, morally, just from the fiber of our beings. However, we're also social scientists and um, in sharing the science behind any potential successes or missteps, all of it is really important. So our team is also committed to publishing in academic journals and presenting. We've presented at peer reviewed academic conferences and we'll continue to do that as well. So that we're first and foremost applying science to saving lives right now in the state and the nation, but also growing that body of science to help others um, continue to do the same kind of work. But to go back to your comment, um, Dan, we have another question in the chat and it is without calling out any particular state, why were other states so flat footed in their organization communication and response? And I don't know, Major Nelson, if you want to start with that one, considering you were there from the beginning um, and then Dr. Tosca, you can follow up with more communication stuff. Sure. Um, so I think kind of what we learned overall or what we have learned since the, the rollout is um, even in West Virginia, uh, we started planning for vaccinations arriving in November. We stood up the Joint Interagency Task Force on 30 November, and the first vaccines arrived in West Virginia on December 14th or 15th. So really, um, with the pandemic in mind, we had a hard time getting people here, but we knew that was going to be the best approach was to have people sitting all at the same table. And that's um, really been a key to West Virginia's success is that um, that interagency task force model, which is um, rooted in military terminology. So again, it goes back to having everybody working toward a common goal. Um, and West Virginia is lucky in that it's a, it's, it's a whole state, but it's a smaller state, and we have a good relationship through the National Guard with all of our counties um, because we have had to do so many emergency responses previously, um, and our, our leadership had been in place for a long time. General Hoyer had been the adjutant general for around 10 years, um, had a lot of um, the governor had a lot of faith and confidence in his abilities to lead this response um, and National Guard, the National Guard had been like a key to the logistics and the um, operational planning from the beginning. Um, so when we were looking at uh, the vaccination process, it, it only made sense that we use a construct that we had done previously to host um, what we have in the state is uh, a Boy Scout Jamboree. So we have um, tens of thousands of um, Boy Scouts that come here. We have a lot of interagency partners and we wanna make sure that we have a successful event. So we bring all of those um, agencies to the table and um, we plan and we prepare and we practice for what it's gonna look like. And, and that has really helped us out. But we learned later on that we should have started much sooner in the planning and getting everybody on board because uh, as anybody who was involved early on, um, it was chaotic. It was some of the hardest days of my life, harder than being deployed and I was here <laughs> And coming to work every single day. We just had a lot to learn in managing um, vaccines that require um, environmental um, precautions with ultra low cold storage. Um, how do you logistically keep it at the right temperature and move it to rural areas that other states like a, um, a Texas or you know Ohio is really not having to deal with mountains where people don't have access to internet and um, communications to understand even about the vaccine. So there were a lot of challenges that West Virginia faced, but I think we we use the same approach that we would to anything else, and um, we just kind of had some grit and determination. And West Virginia um, made a lot of choices along the way, whether it be um, kind of holding on doing the federal pharmacy program and using our local partners to um, get our long-term care facilities vaccinated early on, 
um, those people who are at most ri uh, risk and sticking to the priorities and having those priorities established early on kind of helped in our success. I mean, I think you saw states that um, were very restrictive in their um, recommendations of who could access the vaccine first. So that also seemed to cause problems later on. And, and we had a kind of a motto like, yes, we want to get to those who are most vulnerable, but we're not going to waste any vaccines every week. We had a battle rhythm where um, vaccines come into the state um, by a Wednesday or Thursday, they're out to the communities and um, shots are being put into arms from Thursday through Sunday and we start the process again over on Monday. So we were administering 100% of the vaccine that came into the state um, and everybody was on board with that. So um, it really was a lot of work on the back end and um, we continue to learn a, a lot through this process. Um, but there, there's so many things that we could say has been the key to our success, but I think overall it's just West Virginians being West Virginians um, has really been uh, the key to how we've done it. Yeah. Um, so sorry to cut you off, Dr. Totske, but you'll have to share your thoughts um, in a different form because we've hit one o'clock. So, but I just want to thank all of you for joining us here today and hearing our story and asking questions. I want to give a special thanks to my phenomenal colleagues that I could not adore more, Dr. Toske and Major Nelson, for joining me today. Um, and I want to encourage you all to visit integrate.wvu.edu for upcoming sessions, recording of previous episodes, and to subscribe to receive updates. <laughs> um, but really, thank you all for joining today. And feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions. I know that I've answered a few in the chat, um, but I I am welcome. I, I welcome you to reach out. My email is there and it's JD Frostino, F R A U S T I N O, at mail.w.edu. And I can put you into contact with Dr. Toske and Major Nelson as well. So thank you for your time and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs>